I think we're going to get started. Uh, this is great. Thanks, everybody, for coming. What a nice crowd. Uh, we're, at the, uh, we're, we're here today to talk about the trade and development nexus. And uh, we have a very interesting uh, group assembled. Uh, this is part of the U.S. Leadership and Development Project here at CSIS. I'm Dan Rundy. I'm co-leading the U.S. Leadership and Development Project with my colleague, Joanna Nesseth, who's in the back there, waving. And then uh, we've, uh, we're doing this in partnership with Chevron. I don't know if my friend Mamadou is here or not. Is Ma Mamadou Bay or someone else from Chevron here? Uh, anyway, so Mamadou will be here shortly, I suspect. So. Uh, and it's uh, a new three to five year initiative uh, that uh, we've launched with, uh, you, there's information about it outside. Uh, but one of the areas that we're focusing on is the role of the private sector in development. And so we've been, we've had a series of discussions with folks from OPIC and from uh, USTDA. Uh, and today we're very uh, honored to have Assistant Secretary Fernandez uh, uh, from the U.S. Department of State here, who's going to be leading a discussion, and we have a, have a number of other participants uh, with me, along with uh, Bill Lane, who's Director of Government Affairs here at, at, in Washington uh, for Caterpillar. Uh, but it's also a real pleasure to have my colleague, uh, uh, Meredith Broadbent, who's the Shoal Chair for uh, Trade here as well, and who's going to make some, some introductory remarks to frame up the conversation. Um, but I'm going to stop there. I'm going to ask uh, my friend and colleague Meredith just to make a few framing remarks about the trade and development nexus. Thanks, Dan. I really wanted to, to welcome Bill and Assistant Secretary Fernandez today. Uh, it's going to be it's an exciting time for trade, and I was further excited to see in Wikipedia uh, Secretary Fernandez's bio that says he's a lifelong supporter of commercial engagement. And so I, I say that with some trepidation quoting Wikipedia. But since you're here to yeah. correct the record if it's not true, I feel safe in saying that, and I think it is true. What have we come to, huh? <laughs> Wikipedia. Um, by way of introduction, I just wanted to sort of, as we launch our, our Chevron program here on the role of trade, the, the trade aspects of development, um, our general orientation is that, that we see that um, trade agreements and the expansion of commercial relations through private sector investment in developing countries are a major contributor to economic development. And they're an effective means to project the rule of law and US influence around the globe. In addition, trade agreements can be a strong tool uh, in the president's foreign policy toolkit, but only if you can get on the same page with Congress. And I think there's good news on that front. You know, After a few very quiet years, there's been some sort of a terribly exciting time for for the trade types in this audience, and you know who you are because uh, it's, a, it's a special world and we start talking about non-markup markups of trade agreements and the Congress and the administration actively getting the details down on the legislative language that will take to implement these agreements, we're making huge progress and I, I'm confident that we're going to get there and it's going to be very important for the United States that we'll be able to, to speak with, with a single voice on, on our posture towards these, these very important agreements. Um, the, uh, the role of trade and development is something that we want to investigate further and we'll be working with many of you in the audience to sort of bring to bear some of the new ideas that are out there. Um, but the FTAs that are under active consideration in Congress um, are, are, are valuable market access agreements. They, they pry open foreign markets for U.S. exporters and farmers and service <coughs> providers. But they also promote the development purpose of aiding the establishment of environments that are, are welcoming to business and to private sector initiatives because they're characterized by more due process and governmental transparency. USTR in the past has pointed out that, that countries that open highly regulated sectors like telecommunications and financial services under trade agreements grow 1.5 percentage points faster than countries where these markets in those countries are closed and non-transparent. And all three of these free trade agreements have robust investment chapters that uh, set up uh, strong rule of law disciplines and access to dispute settlement and those protections. So as we move into a, a, an interesting conversation here between the, the, the administration setting the policy and how the private sector is going to play in that role, um, I'm looking forward to, to the comments that, that we'll have on these trade agreements, the issues of capacity building, uh, what, what maybe some of our experience on the, the CAFTA has shown us, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, and what we see coming forward is U.S. policy toward the Arab countries, the, the Arab Spring countries that are, 
undergoing so much change right now. So I really look forward to today's panel. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Meredith. Maybe we could start with a, a question about the trade and development nexus. I think Meredith did a great job of framing up what the benefits are, but maybe uh, Assistant Secretary Fernandez, maybe you could start just from your, your perspective. Obviously, you've done a lot of thinking about this and also both your work uh, in the private sector and also your <coughs> work at, in public service uh, is, is really at that, at that sweet spot. And then I'm hoping Bill will also uh, comment on that. Thank you, Dan, and it's good to see uh, Bill, and, and thank you, Meredith, for those words. Um, one of the, the things that brought me into, into government um, was w what I saw as, as, a, as an opportunity to, to really um, uh, take that sweet spot that you mentioned, Dan, uh, of business and development, and, and really... Is it on? Okay. Is it on? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. <coughs> Thank you. The sweet spot of business this, and development. Anyway, the, if, if in, our, in our Bureau, Economics, Energy, and Business, one of the things that we always talk about, and it's really one of the things that brought me into government, was, was to be able to mine that convergence of business and development. You know, business is not um, uh, always an angel. I, I know that from, from having worked for 30 years as a lawyer in, in New York. But there, there are spots where uh, I, I, you can, if you do it right, you can both make money and you can also help develop. Uh, and I'm looking at, um, uh, for example, some of the initiatives that we've taken on that we talk about all the time in our bureau. Uh, agriculture, you, you have U.S. agricultural companies uh, that are able to, um, uh, that have the technology today to be able to grow more food in places like Africa and, and do it in a sustainable way and at the same time uh, uh, do, do good for their, do well for their shareholders. And so that sweet spot of, of businesses and development is something that I think uh, we have overlooked too often and I, I think it's something good that I and, and people in my, in my bureau and in government in general, certainly Secretary Clinton has spoken about it, uh, it's something that we're intending to, uh, to really drive. Bill, you, you're on the U.S. Global Leadership Campaign's board. You've been on the Sid Washington board. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, can you talk about, there's an obvious reason why, as uh, Director of Government Affairs for Caterpillar, you've been so involved on development issues. And could you talk about the trade sure. and development nexus? Yeah, if I, if I could, and especially for the, the students that are in the audience, uh, you couldn't pick a better month to come to Washington because uh, it's really cool this month and it's, no, it's very <laughs> comfortable. Um, but I mean, it, this is actually a month that we could really see a pivot point uh, that could, uh, could, could move the direction on a wide range of issues, hopefully in the right direction. Um, I've been with Caterpillar for 35, 36 years, a long time. And I have to tell you, in some ways we haven't changed, in some ways we, we have. I mean, we've always been focused on exports and on overseas markets. Um, but if you go back long enough, you would hear an expression from a lot of our executives, which would be something like, we believe in trade, not aid. Well, we probably believe in trade more now than we ever have in our whole corporate history. But we also realize that for some problems, dealing with disease, the clean water, things of that sort, that unless you hit a certain hygiene level, trade's not gonna make a big difference. So you really do have to address uh, the, the AIDS epidemic in Africa or Latin America or Asia. You really do have to uh, go after uh, uh, governance issues that we're trying to do with the MCC and what have you. So I mean, there's a, there's a threshold there, and I think it, this isn't just unique to Caterpillar, I think corporate America gets it. And as a result of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, we've got a couple hundred companies that play a big role to try to make sure that the international affairs budget is adequately funded. And uh, we've seen uh, pretty good growth in that budget over the last 10 years. Secondly, over half of what we make in the United States at Caterpillar, we export. And we've always been big exporters. But in the last four years, something else has changed. Over half of what we export now we export to non-OECD countries. So this, this, this notion that there's a great promise in the developing world, the promise isn't there anymore. It's a reality. And if you're not part of it, you're really missing out on an opportunity. Uh, one of the initiatives I'm trying to champion up at Penn State is young people love to go overseas. We liked to go overseas when we were students. And we always went to countries that were really uh, hardship assignments like in Italy or in France and things like that. And the students still like to have those type of hardship experiences. 
The question is, how do you get <laughs> folks to go to other countries that really are not quite as exotic or glamorous? And that's a challenge, and that's what we're trying to promote. So you know, the point being, there's, there's a lot of ways you can address this, and we're going to talk about bilateral agreements, we're going to talk about regional agreements, but more than anything else, there has to be a change in focus. And that change in focus has to be one dealing with engagement, dealing with embracing the future, and trying to hide from the future. The American companies that have done the best job, and, I, and this is a bit of an advertisement, I think Caterpillar falls <coughs> in those ranks, are the ones that have seen the future as an opportunity, and we haven't tried to hide from it. So whether it's proposed sanctions against China, or whether it's protectionist initiatives uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, rapidly uh, growing countries like in India and, and um, in uh, Latin America, countries or companies and peoples that have focused on opportunities have had the most success. Those that have tried to hide or buy time or manage decline are the ones where you, you've really seen a, uh, a downward spiral. Bill, let me start with you, and I want to uh, bring in uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Fernandez, and also hope Meredith may comment on this as well. About uh, to, we, We've talked a lot about uh, Colombia and Panama. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about how you say, how Plan Colombia sort of teed up the, the agreement that we currently have with, with uh, Colombia? Well, you know, everybody loves to talk about failure. And we talk, like to talk about how partisan this town is. And there's lots of failure out there, and there's a lot of partisanship. But I have to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, Plan Columbia may be the best counterinsurgency program this country's ever embarked on. Now think about this. If you go back 12, 14 years, Columbia was on the verge of being a failed state. There was all sorts of, uh, between paramilitary and the FARC and the narco traffickers and what have you, uh, the government was losing battalion-sized battles in a very important country. The U.S., by embracing smart power, and this was President Clinton teaming up with Speaker Hastert, they started up a program, Plan Columbia, which was really an effort to embrace both improving the hard power aspects of foreign policy, but also the civil society aspects. They did it for a sustained period of time. It was never an inexpensive uh, uh, endeavor. It was never a perfect endeavor. But when you look at the cost of the entire 12-year period, it's about equal to three weeks in Afghanistan. And today we have a thriving democracy. Like all democracies, it's not perfect, but it's made a difference. Today, wherever you go, people talk about we need to do a better job embracing smart power. Well, this is a place where we really did do smart power. And now, hopefully in the next few weeks, we're going to uh, cement those gains with a free trade agreement. So what do we get out of the free trade agreement? For those of you who need to regulate your fatigue, we have a guaranteed access to good coffee for as long as the eye can see. <laughs> for those of you who um, sometimes miss important dates, you have an ample supply of flowers. And for those of you who thought they, your mother loved your sister more than you, you can always give her flowers at Mother's Day at a very reasonable cost. Not only that, People don't realize how important the Latin markets are. Uh, some of the biggest coal mines in the world are in Colombia. So Caterpillar, it's one of Caterpillar's 10 largest export markets. Peru, that a free trade agreement went into effect two, two years ago, we saw our exports to Peru go up 60%. And one of the, my favorite trade agreements that I've ever worked on was on Chile. And what we saw with Chile was U.S. exports to Chile went up threefold, and U.S. imports from Chile went up threefold. But what did we get? We got fresh grape, grapes in, in the winter, which made us all a little healthier. And um, we got crushed grapes year round, which made us all a little happier. So, uh, you know, the, the, the trade notion doesn't solve everything, but I have to say one thing. It does make life better by both those who export and those who import. And if I had one slight criticism of uh, some of our current leaders, we're now talking about trade, but only in an export context. We need to talk tr about trade both ways, because we benefit, for the really young people in here, the Pokemon card that you received, was that more valuable than the one you traded? And uh, you know, trade is important, and we benefit both from the export side of things, but also from the import side. Assistant Secretary Fernandez, Plan Colombia, the, the Colombia and Panama Free Trade Agreements, the opportunity. Well, look, in, in Latin America, not just in Colombia, the, 
the real challenge going forward is to have growth with uh, social inclusion. How do you do that? Well, you, you help uh, to create a middle class. You try and promote uh, the rule of law. You try and give people opportunities that weren't there before. Uh, that's what trade does. Uh, and in, in a place like Colombia, uh, uh, the, the, fr the free trade agreement uh, will, will enable Colombian exporters to continue exporting here. Uh, but more importantly, from our side, and I, I take what Bill said in terms of, of the criticism of, of, of the current uh, leadership in government, but in terms of our exports, uh, we have to realize that most, if not all, of Colombia's exports today come into this country duty-free. Uh, and yet, our exports into Colombia pay an average of 7 to 15 percent in customs duties. Uh, some of them pay as much as 260 percent. So yes, you'll be able to get flowers uh, to give your loved ones uh, at some point of the year. But at the same time, you'll be able to, we will be able to export automobiles, we'll be able to export uh, agricultural products, uh, Caterpillar will be able to, to uh, export its equipment without a customs duty, and in, in, in doing so, we'll be able to compete uh, with uh, countries in the, in the Mercosur region that uh, will not pay any, uh, with the European Union and with others that have signed agreements with Colombia. So what we have to realize is it, we will help, and it's, it's a good combination of business and development. It will help our exports. We'll be able to, to continue exporting into what is today the third largest uh, market of, uh, in, in Latin America for, for the U.S. But at the same time, we'll be able to promote growth and we'll be able to promote stability and we'll be able to solidify the, uh, the changes that have been brought about by Plan Colombia. Plan Colombia has gone through its first stage, and that first stage was an economic, uh, well, sorry, it was a military. Uh, um, stage, but at this point the challenge is, uh, is to solidify that and to do that in a way uh, that's sustainable. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is with trade, with growth, and with social inclusion. Great. The, okay, well let me ask you, you were, we were talking about earlier as well in the green room about, uh, about the Arab Spring and you, we were, you gave some remarks at the, you, at the Egypt Forward Conference that I thought was a great conference that USTDA put on last yeah. week. Uh, on you know, in less than two months' notice, had a thousand people, uh, and any number of different mi ministers from the traditional governments in Egypt had a bra had the the whole it, Obama administration was you guys were there in force. It was really a great success on the part of TDA, and I think a great success uh, for the Obama administration. Um, you gave some remarks there, and you've also given some remarks recently. You were in Tunisia, so you've been you've been thinking about and working on the issues of, of how to consolidate the gains of the Arab Spring. Could you talk a little bit about what, what needs to happen there? And sure. Well, I mean, that was a great conference. Uh, and by the way, USTDA, uh, it, it, there's an agency where you get uh, the bang for your buck. That's a, that's a great little agency, and it does a fabulous job. Uh, we have been, at the State Department, in our bureau, we've been working on, in, in North Africa really for the last six to nine months before the beginning of the Arab Spring. My first trip to the region was back in November. And the reason we did that is that you could see that there was a problem <coughs> brewing. You had a demographic bulge. You, have, uh, you had 30 to 40 percent of the population between 18 to 25 years of age. The unemployment rates uh, were, were, were high. And they, the more educated uh, that you were as a young person, uh, the harder it was to get a job. That was a recipe for, uh, for a disaster. That was a recipe for unrest. What we've been trying to do since, since then, basically, again, since the end of last year, was to, to look for ways where we could work with governments to, uh, to help create jobs. Uh, and to do so by using the private sector, by trying to create, uh, help, help create small and medium enterprises, by bringing entrepreneurs into the region, by bringing U.S. investors into the region, by talking about what the private sector <coughs> could do uh, in, in, in North Africa and in Egypt, and, and, and to do so in a way uh, where we could both benefit, where our businesses uh, could, could export and, and, and could invest in these places, and at the same time, having their private sector also have better links and, and with, uh, with the private sector in the U.S. Great. 
Talk, if you could talk about the Doha round, I want to I want to shift to the Doha round. We've had a discussion about this bill. Maybe I'll ask you to, to lead off, and then maybe perhaps <coughs> Mer Meredith, you might comment on the on the Doha round as well, and then we'll let Assistant Secretary Fernandez uh, comment. Uh, uh, Bill, we're we're at sort of an interesting sure. place in the Doha round, right? Maybe you could just just comment on. I mean, this was supposed well, to be the development round. You know, uh, the. Um, you know, you, you're always trying to find the right cliche. You know, this, if you gotta have a cliche generator, and you know, one of them is it's always darkest before the dawn. And uh, the only thing I can say, it's been a very long night, and uh, <laughs> we're, 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 we're hoping that's true, but uh, so far we're still in that dark period. Um, you know, historically we've had these, uh, these rounds, if you will, through the multilateral negotiations, and the last one was the Uruguay round, which uh, was completed uh, in uh, 1995. Uh, very comprehensive. It was probably the most ambitious of any of the rounds. I think there was about nine of them going back. To th this was sort of the unwinding of the protectionism of the 30s that, that took place, and it was part of the Bretton Woods reforms and what have you. Um, and, it, and it's worked. It's reduced trade barriers pretty remarkably. And uh, after 9-11, we launched the, uh, the Doha round. And the, uh, and the goal was to focus primarily on uh, the developing countries. But of course, you're always using this as a way to reduce trade barriers overall. Uh, we've got a 10th year anniversary coming up. And th there's always positioning that takes place. But you have, uh, whether they're, they're companies or whether they're NGOs or whether they're governments, everybody has their own uh, strategy that they're involved with. Uh, from a Caterpillar point of view, I mean, this could be the mother load of free trade for Caterpillar. Uh, as part of the Uruguay round, developed countries eliminated their tariffs on the machines that we make. So if you buy a Caterpillar bulldozer in the United States or Europe or Japan, there's no, no tariff on it right now. But there's still pretty sizable tariffs in a lot of the developing world. And as part of the, uh, uh, the last proposal by the Europeans, they said, well, you know, for these 10 sectors of the economy that agreed to zero tariffs, in developed countries, let's make that for everybody. And so that included like machinery or agricultural machinery and medical equipment and paper and wood products, beer, it had beer, you know, you imagine that would come right to the top of the list. Uh, distilled spirits was in the list. But, but anyway, that, there's uh, pharmaceuticals was, was another one. So the, you know, there's some, there's some strong uh, commercial benefits, but it's good for consumers as well. Um, but it's really not gotten a whole lot of traction. Nobody's really embraced that, that, that concept so far. Uh, and then you've got sort of, okay, let's just focus on what helps developing countries. So there's talk about a plan B, and that deals with capacity building. You know, it's essentially uh, removing trade barriers that are sort of man-made in the sense of uh, bad customs regimes and what have you. Or uh, duty-free, quota-free, in other words, for the LDC countries, for the poorest of the poorest countries. Let's get rid of all tariffs and quotas, uh, which would be very, very positive, particularly for the Cambodias of the world and the, uh, the Bangladeshis. Uh, just a, a, a factoid, if you will, the US gives Bangladesh about $70 million a year in aid, and we collect about $600 million a year in revenue in the way of tariffs, because they produce the products that have the highest tariffs on them, uh, clothes and, and shoes. So um, you know, this would be an opportunity to really help uh, those type uh, LDC countries, and that really hasn't gotten much traction, which really raises the question. And, I, and here I want to criticize business, I want to criticize the NGO community, and I want to criticize governments. It's been 10 years, but you don't hear business in a big energetic way saying we need a robust round and we need to get this done. And when I say business, I'm not just talking about US business. I'm talking about business around the world. A very, you know, you know, this is an opportunity to really generate uh, economic growth over the next 10, 20 years. And so far, that's an opportunity we haven't focused on. NGO community, the goal is to help development. And if the goal is to help development, everyone should be embracing uh, a, a world with uh, duty-free, quota-free access for the poorest of the poor countries. I mean, you know, it's hard enough being poor. You know, you don't have to really pile on with high taxes. So, I mean, you know, the NGO community needs to play a bigger role. And as far as governments are concerned, you know, there's nothing exciting talking about multilateral agreements. But we all know if you do it right, you really can generate positive um, uh, uh, benefits 
not just on a regional or a bilateral basis, but you can do it on a global basis. And we really need the, the, the governments. We don't have uh, folks talking like they did uh, when we had the Bretton Woods uh, uh, talks. We don't have uh, some of the leaders on both sides of the party uh, that, uh, that will really address these issues. I remember during the Uruguay round, uh, Senator Moynihan, in a talk show that was dealing with some scandal at the time, talk, stopped the talk show for seven minutes to give a boring rendition about the GATT. And the, I'm sure the ratings dropped, but it was an important thing to do. We need to have some leaders that are willing to bore people to death to force them to do the right thing. <laughs> Meredith? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a, a, a great summary of a lot of the options and possibilities that are available in the Doha round. I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of great groundwork that's been, been laid, but, but it's not coming to fruition in the, in the short term. Um, I think all of us will continue to work on it. And uh, there was, you know, I think a different viewpoint on really what, what energized development. And part of the United States' view on that was that uh, opening up trade, reducing all of our high tariffs for developing countries ought to be reciprocated a bit by some market openings in advanced developing countries. And you have a lot of countries that are benefiting a lot from the trading system. The, the WTO is guarding their imports through rules of non-discrimination, fair treatment in their export markets. And still it was very hard to measure what some of the advanced developing countries were really willing to contribute in terms of market opening. And I think the last I heard on even on their applied tariffs, they weren't willing to, to bind the, the tariffs that they were collecting. They wanted to only commit to, to uh, uh, opening at a much higher level that's not even really relevant to the real world trade. So um, I would be interested to hear what the Assistant Secretary has to say about development in the Doha round and, and what we might be able to achieve in the future. So Assistant Secretary Fernandez, you're going to bore us to death? Uh, yeah, that I can do easily on any subject. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was hoping to just sort of be ignored for a while on this one. Um, look, uh, I, th I, I think both of you have, have laid out the problem. Uh, I think we all have a right to be concerned about the, uh, the state of the Doha round. Uh, uh, we are not ready to throw in the towel. We have a number of colleagues who are spending um, all of their time and effort trying to, to, to see if there's any way that we, can, that we can bring it to fruition. The fundamental question and the thing that divides, um, that divides all sides at this point is what, what kinds of contributions are you going to ask from the advanced emerging countries, from the Chinas of the world, uh, Brazil, India? Uh, the current state of negotiations would have 97% of India's industrial goods uh, be shielded from, from competition. Uh, we don't think that's an appropriate result. Uh, there's no movement, as far as we can tell, on services. So I think there's a lot of negotiations to be done. Uh, uh, we are, but we're, we're still at the table. And we are going to remain at the table until the last possible minute, because we think uh, that ultimately there's a deal that ought to be done and that I think we would all benefit from. But what's on the table now is just not acceptable. Okay, I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. <coughs> uh, we've got some microphones, so I'm looking for, uh, I'll call on uh, hands uh, if people have questions for Assistant Secretary Fernandez or the other folks up here. Okay, we're, we're going to bunch a couple of them. So if you can identify yourself, your name, and also if you can put, place it in the form uh -huh. of a question. Thank you very much, Raghavir Goel. I cover the State Department also uh, from India Globe in Asia today. My question is, recently, U.S. and India had the largest uh, economic and financial agreement or whether it's a dialogue at the Treasury Department. So where do we stand now as far as India-U.S. Uh, uh, economic relations and trade relations are concerned because now India is seeking second green revolution also from the United States and also finally uh, some equipments also they are seeking security and also economic uh, development. Other, other questions? Let me bunch these together. Other, other questions? We can take. Uh, the woman in the back. Yeah, the, I think this one. Yeah. Um, assuming that the free trade agreements between Panama, Colombia, and South Korea are, are going to get passed, what would you say is going to be the toughest part about implementing those free trade agreements? Okay. And then there's another one. There's a uh, there's a woman up here. You know. Uh, 
Thank you so much, uh, Sherry Stevenson, Organization of American States. Um, when the panelists responded to the question about uh, duty-free, quota-free, I don't think that they actually responded to the duty-free, quota-free element for the least, which is only applicable to the least developed countries. The response was more that what's on the table is not adequate for the BRICS or the, you know, the large emerging developing markets. What is the position with respect to duty-free, quota-free? Is there a problem with that being a part of the package for the end of this year, 2011, as what uh, Director General Lamy sort of is proposing in terms of an initial development early harvest, and then we can continue to negotiate next year? Let me start with, let me start with Bill, if you want to just take any of, those, any of those questions. Well, I don't think that there should be a problem. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the notion is less is easier to sell than more. It's always been my experience, more is easier to sell than less. But uh, the, um, you know, you're going to, there's some folks that will oppose duty-free, quota-free because the, the commercial element with some of the LDC countries. Um, my hope would, I'm, we're, we, in this case, I'm referring to Caterpillar, we're still a plan A company. We still would like to see something that's more robust and, uh, you know, I agree with the, uh, with the Secretary. There's not a lot on the table right now, but a lot of our negotiating partners have also indicated there won't be until the last, the very end of the negotiations. So uh, in a way, there's an uh, uh, element of chicken uh, when you finally do light the fuse for the final time. And, you, you know, and the goal would be to be as close as we can when we get to that final uh, effort because there's, there's really been so many disappointments. I mean, only the Doha round after 10 years can use the word early harvest and uh, not have the room uh, start laughing. But um, uh, so from that standpoint, I, I think um, uh, help for the LDC or LDC uh, duty-free, quota-free, in, in the hemisphere that's primarily just Haiti. But even with Haiti, you would think uh, you know, we should be able to import ethanol and sugar and things of that sort. Um, but um, the, the second question dealt with implementation. I don't think the implementation is going to be very hard. I mean, we've, uh, we've you know, had good examples, in, at least in Latin America, as far as uh, uh, Peru and Chile and, uh, and, and CAFTA, and they've all had very positive uh, outcomes. One fact that I'd just like to leave you with is when you look at the U.S. trade deficit, which is large, and you break it into the different components, the U.S. has a trade surplus in services. The U.S. has a trade surplus in agriculture. The U.S. has a big trade deficit in oil, and we have an even bigger trade deficit in manufactured goods. With the exception of the 17 countries as a group that we have free trade agreements with, we have a trade surplus in manufacturing goods as a group of those 17 countries. And that includes everyone from Israel to Chile to Canada to Mexico. Some of those individual countries we have a deficit, but overall we have a surplus. Which tells you that if we really do have a level, level playing field, American manufacturers can hold their own or hold their own and some. You know, so what do we need if we really are concerned about the, uh, the trade deficit? We need more domestic energy and we, more, we need more free trade. And the next first step in that direction will be with these three free trade agreements. Assistant Secretary. Yeah, let me, let me take a couple of the questions on India. Um, I actually was in India a couple of months ago, and um, my colleague Bob Hormass has been there a number of times, and in fact is scheduled to be there in the next couple of weeks. And I know that Secretary Clinton at some point is going to go there fairly soon. I think the opportunities in India are, are immense, and, and especially in something that I think uh, Caterpillar and a number of other companies are good at it, and that's infrastructure. In, uh, the Indian government has announced plans to invest up to a billion dollars in infrastructure in the next couple of years. Um, that's, that means roads, water systems, uh, power plants. They, they are interested in, in what we have to offer in the uh, renewable energy front. They're interested in what we have to offer in terms of post-harvest technologies. You know, in India, uh, you mentioned the, the second green revolution. India, and as well as a number of other countries, India loses 
of its produce from the time it leaves the field to the time it, it, it gets to the market. Um, if, you could just, if you could do something about that, you'd increase the, the supply of food in India. That's something that some of our companies are very good at, cold, you know, cold storage, transport. Uh, and they're very interested. So I, I'm, I'm very bullish, and I intend to keep pursuing that relationship. Uh, on the er early harvest, I think, um, um, uh, I think there are some wines, actually, the er early, early harvest wines that are sweet <laughs> wines, <laughs> that some of them take 10 That's years. Um, <laughs> but I, I will agree with you that, that you can't call anything after 10 years early. The, 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 the real question, and I think we're open to, to discussions on, 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 on early harvest, but the real question is, what about the rest? You know, in, in any negotiation, what do, you, what do you leave for a second round? Um, but I think, you know, I, I think from a USG point of view, as I mentioned, uh, we are not playing a game of chicken. Uh, at this stage, we believe we've offered really as much as, as, as we can, um, and, and therefore, I, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope for a good solution. But in terms of an early harvest, that's something we're willing to consider. Uh, but again, what do you do with the, what was supposed to be the rest of a very ambitious agenda? And that's something that still has to be discussed. Meredith. Yeah, I just want to follow up with your, your comments on <coughs> the partnerships that are really pu public, the opportunities in India, in India for investment mm -hmm. and so forth. And on the gentleman's question here, expanding trade and economic relations with India, I don't think anyone would think a free trade agreement would be in order with India at this point. But an element of our free trade agreement is a robust investment chapter, or the alternative <coughs> model would be a bi bilateral investment yep. treaty with mm -hmm. the Indians, mm -hmm. who have amazingly enough show, showed a bit of interest yes, in, la in the last right. couple of weeks. Um, and it really, it, it's an interesting situation the U.S. is in now because we don't really have a position on what a model bilateral investment treaty would be to engage in that negotiation. And maybe you could update us on some of your, your <laughs> internal discussions on, on this model bit. You've got great information. Uh, uh, well, the, uh, the Indians have, in fact, uh, expressed interest in pursuing a, a bilateral investment treaty with us. And, in fact, we're expecting to have what we call technical talks. Uh, with the Indian government soon, and we're really looking forward to that. Uh, in terms of the model, ba you know, that was the first item that I tackled uh, back in December of 2009. That was my first assignment. It's, I had just arrived. They said you're leading, the, you're co-leading the inner agency on the bilateral model, uh, bilateral, bilateral investment treaty. I didn't even know what an interagency was, never mind what I was supposed to lead. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, we're, we're, we, we've, um, we still have some issues to resolve, uh, uh, but that's not going to keep us from uh, pursuing technical talks with, with the Indians. I think the issues that are, uh, you know, that, that still have to be resolved uh, w with the uh, bilateral investment treaty is, is un not surprisingly. Uh, questions of, you know, labor rights. Uh, uh, environmental issues and the like, uh, but for the most part, I think people will find that the uh, the new model bit doesn't differ that much from the previous model bit. So we feel, uh, in a, with countries such as <coughs> India, that we can we can start uh, uh, technical negotiations. Time for a couple more questions, gentlemen in the back, and then uh, the gentleman up front. Thank you. Uh, it's Dana Marshall. Thanks very much to this panel. I wonder if I could draw out the Assistant Secretary a little bit on uh, the Arab Spring issues, the Deauville Declaration, statements by President Obama, talk about expansion of trade and investment initiatives with respect to the region. I wonder if uh, the administration has come up with any more specifics on what might be done uh, in those areas for those countries. Sure. And uh, gentlemen up here. Steve Landy. Man Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. <laughs> CSIS is developing a unique role, and I cannot tell you how happy I am about it, because you're the only group around, well, I should say that, you're the group I know best that seems to combine a trade and a development focus on so many of your programs, and we need more of it. Let me chat a little bit about DFQF and Sherry's question, who could be opposed to that? I'm not opposed to it if it's put together correctly. We all had a very exciting, a few of us had a very ex exciting experience in Lusaka, including the Assistant Secretary, when Hillary Clinton came. And there's no question, she just wowed the audience, as she roused most audiences. 
And what she spoke about, again, was U.S. commitment to support regional integration. 47 countries in Africa, as Bill Lane just said, can't survive with 47 borders and 47 delays. They really have to be unified. The problem with DFQF as currently constituted is that it excludes 13 countries in Africa. You cannot have regional integration in Africa at the same time as you are giving 30 countries, whatever it is, duty-free access, but not the other countries. Now, what the European Union did, which at least in my view is both trade and, and development was a sin, they told the countries, hey, we don't care whether you form your regional integration. If you want to export your cocoa and you're not an LDC, you guys really have to, you guys simply have to enter into a free trade agreement, which is completely frozen regional integration in two or three regions in Africa. So the issue which I do really ask is when you're considering this, let's be proud of our GO example. We also have an example in public health. And let's simply say that Africa is on its own development course. We are pushing regional integration. And therefore, the beneficiaries of DFQF should be the least developed countries, but also the poorer countries or the countries within Africa. I have not heard anybody yet tell me they had a competitive burp about imports from Cameroons. And the US steel workers haven't called me, and the automobile workers have said they're worried about Congo Brazzaville. But these are countries which happen not to be LDC. So the only question, and I won't ask the Assistant Secretary for a position because I'm just raising the issue, but I really would insist that if we do the DFQF as part of the early harvest, that we do, that we do include the same kind of thing we have in AGOA and designate all the African countries that belong to regional communities. And then require of those regional communities over a number of years that they should begin to negotiate slow, increasing forms of reciprocity. Thank you. Oh, I thought it was well put, very articulate, something that's, you're never going to see uh, a representative from Caterpillar talking about less trade liberalization versus more. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to take free trade wherever and whenever we can, no can get it. <laughs> but, but if I could, because I, we're running out of time, I would like to, to leave you all with one thought. And it's really the challenge that's before us. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, and you know, as, when you're in the middle of a lot of these efforts, whether it's the free trade agreements right now or whatever, sometimes you lose a sense of perspective. And uh, then you, later on, you have a, a chance to reflect. Um, I now truly believe that uh, Bill Clinton was America's greatest free trade president. I really believe that. And I believe President Bush, 43, did more to help poor people around the world, especially in Africa, than any American president. And I absolutely convince that neither one of them got one vote for those two legacy accomplishments. And our challenge here is we gotta figure out a way to get our leaders to do the right thing. And to the degree possible, make sure they get credit for doing the right thing. And that is a challenge, whether it deals with trade, whether it deals with development. Uh, I think we all in the, you know, we, we can talk about nuances, but we all sort of know the right answer. The question is how do we implement the right answer and do it in a way where it's in people's self-interest? And here I'm talking political self-interest. So that's the objective. And, you know, so tonight when you're drinking that Chilean wine, ponder that question and come back to us with some answers. <laughs> so uh, and maybe that's the answer in itself. Meredith, I'll give you a chance to, on this issue of DFQF, do you want to just comment on that? Well, you know, I think it raises, there are a lot of technical issues associated with that and a lot of political issues, and it, it again, raises the, the, the being on the same page with Congress and the administration, because that will take, take legislation and to implement that. So I think you're going to need a comprehensive view of where the United States wants to be in the Doha round, what the next steps are, and, and whether it would make sense to, to implement that <laughs> unilaterally without getting a broader package of contributions from developing countries that will be in their own interest. Assistant Secretary Fernandez. Um, let, let's take the, uh, the, the Arab Spring question first. Um, I, we, we've announced a number of items that I think are, are concrete. Uh, Secretary Clinton announced a $2 billion OPEC fund uh, to help private investment in, in North Africa and, and the other parts of the Middle East. Uh, our bureau, and the reason I went to Tunisia uh, a month ago, was to work on what we call the North African Partnership uh, for Economic Opportunity, NAPIO. You may have heard about that. And that's, that's a, 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 an effort to bring U.S. entrepreneurs and U.S. investors uh, into North Africa 
and to have linkages between universities, uh, investors, uh, and, 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 and young people. Uh, we will have uh, delegations of entrepreneurs that will be uh, going to Morocco, to Tunisia, uh, and to Algeria in, in September and October. We'll bring entrepreneurs there. We'll also bring investors. Uh, we, uh, and because one of the things is a lot of potential in, 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 in a place like Tunisia, in a place like, uh, uh, like Egypt, but you've got to find investors that are willing to incubate uh, some of those ideas. And we've, for example, um, a couple of months ago, we had a, an entrepreneurship contest in Egypt where we uh, had 100 entrepreneurs, uh, for Egyptian entrepreneurs, come and, and, and talk to U.S. investors. And, and you actually had some deals that, that came out of that. Um, so we will have concretely uh, entrepreneurship missions, university linkages missions, uh, and cultural missions for entrepreneurs, cultural entrepreneurs, uh, in the next two to three months. Uh, we're also working uh, w to support Egypt's request to, uh, to be eligible, eligible for EBRD funding. That's something that the EBRD did very, very well uh, in 1989 and the late 80s in, in Eastern Europe. If they can play the same role in North Africa, that's something that we would support as well. Uh, so I think, um, you know, I, I think you'll see a number of of, of initiatives as well that aren't as public, but I think are also uh, quite important. For example, in, in Tunisia, one of the things that I proposed to the government, and they seem willing to entertain it, is a, an open skies agreement. Open skies agreement is an agreement to liberalize um, uh, air traffic between two countries. Well, 11% of Tunisia's GDP is, is made up of, of tourism. That tourism is down 50%. Uh, only 1% of their tourists in good times were from the U.S. And part of that is that it takes forever to get to, uh, to get to Tunisia. Well, if we can liberalize traffic, that will help their tourism industry as well. So we've got a number of, of concrete, uh, both short-term, medium-term, and long-term ideas to help support uh, uh, the Arab Spring. D DFQF, do you want to... Oh, um, I forgot the question. The... Uh, just um, the uh, whether you would unilaterally, we, we would do a unilateral DFQF absent the rest of the package. You know, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to get back to you on that one. I, I think um, I certainly, I think, I think we are open, and USTR uh, is open to discussing it. Whether it's something that on, on its own uh, we'd be willing to support, I'd need to, I need to check with my my, my colleagues. Okay, I think our time has has come to an end. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel. Okay. We've got a uh, just the coming attractions on July 28th. Brian Atwood, TBD, the time, but watch this space. Uh, we're going to have Brian Atwood, who's uh, the head of the DAC and former head of AID, will be here. So that's a Thursday, July the 28th. So thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Secretary. Good job. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we'll celebrate.